I am Michelle, and this is Plato, and we're back again. Last week, we got into the subject of initiations, and we promised that we were going to come back, and we were going to, like, really dive into the subject. So that's what we're talking about today. What is an initiation? How is it that all these time I've been in this religion or this religion, and I've actually been initiated, and I don't even know? Like, what does that mean? We are going to really dive into what exactly it is. And, you know, some of the myths behind it or the beliefs that kind of get wrapped around it and some of the truth that um, we're going to kind of uncover for you guys to have a better understanding. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. So maybe first what we should talk about is uh, really what initiation is and just kind of define it. And then we could talk a little bit about some examples and then talk about the the manner by which initiation is used for spiritual development uh, and its importance and um, how uh, people can use, can leverage it in their lives for their own uh, spiritual elevation. Mm -hmm. So what is initiation? Well, when we just think about the word to initiate, we all inherently understand that that means to begin something, right? In terms of a, of a spiritual uh, definition of it, initiation is, you know, the process of, of going through some type of, of event that arouses the psychological and emotional response for the purpose of opening oneself up to uh, forces or knowledge and information that they were previously unaware and also begins a deeper journey into the spirit. So there's um, lots of manners by which we probably are familiar with initiation that maybe uh, we didn't know about or didn't conceive of them. Um, but something like baptism is an, initi- an initiation. A bar mitzvah is an initiation. Um, you know, joining a fraternity, uh, one goes through certain initiation procedures, right? And what, you know, what's kind of common through these examples and other types of initiation ceremonies is that there's symbolism involved. Um, there are usually some speeches which, you know, help to trigger certain aspects of the subconscious to to come forth. There's usually, um, you know, something that evokes a a, a very emotional response um, within the individual, Um, you know, and and, and if not in the individual, for example, if somebody gets baptized when they're a baby, right, at least the people around them, right, like the parents, for example. Now, the initiation is really, you know, whatever form that it takes, it's really just the beginning of something, right? It's meant to, to make you aware of something. And if, if we think about the mystical traditions, another component of the mystical traditions and also a component of certain church initiations um, like baptism is, is to instill essentially an energy or a current into that person, which to their energetic body now kind of it instigates a reaction to help elevate it. In the, um, in the Western mystery traditions, something like the Golden Dawn um, School of Mysticism. So this isn't, you know, associated with the political group in Greece, for those of you who are unaware. Um, uh, the, the process of initiation actually formulates the individual into what is known as a talisman. A talisman is something that is created, that collects a light uh, or an energy Um, and it magnifies it uh, within that structure. So then it can be amplified later. And, you know, people will think about things like planetary talismans, or maybe they have a, you know, an onk talisman or something, or sometimes people even have statuettes or figurines of particular divinities. Um, uh, In the Greek Orthodox um, church, for example, um, they practice something called iconography, and um, and that's where uh, an image of a saint or the Holy Mother or Christ, um, you know, is painted, you know, utilizing practices of meditation, but then essentially it's turned into a talisman when the priest 
blesses that that icon and then you take it into your home and it's meant to really just uh you know magnify that particular energy associated with it out into the environment in the golden dawn initiatic system the the human the person is actually turned into a talisman so that they continue um, to collect light at a faster rate than they did previous to the initiation. And then the, the, the practices that go along with that tradition, um, the various magical practices and meditation practices just accelerate that further. And we see that um, as a similar theme in most of the world's major religions and their mystical components. In India, for example, there's a process called puja, um, when somebody, you know, gets initiated into a particular group or sect. Um, this is even used in the Transcendental Meditation Movement. When you learn the TM Cities, you go through an initiation procedure. Um, that's called puja. And, and, and the same thing is happening here. The, the technique utilized is different than something like baptism or something like in the Golden Dawn. But the purpose is the same. The purpose is to is to initiate or begin a new process, a new pathway, and actually to bestow, you know, or bestow, I should say, a current or an energy upon the person that um, that triggers the the acceleration process of spiritual development. That's a great explanation. We also have different types of initiations where somebody's like getting a current on them, like Reiki. So they're drawing, this is where I have a question for you. Um, when you're being initiated um, through Reiki or some other kind of like quantum healing or uh, Ruach healing, when you go through that initiation, and I remember when she did it with me, I mean, she was like hands over me, like, you know, and I mean, she was literally like step one foot forward and putting her hand over me and hovering like this, you know, for like 10 minutes. And she would go around and do that with each person through this process while everybody meditated. When it comes to um, things like Reiki, how is this initiation actually working when it comes to like healing energy, for example? How is it that that initiation now made me a healer? It sounds to me like what you're asking is um, how does the procedure by which the individual is using to um, to transmit that current change and alter you so that you yourself can be healed um, and or so that you can heal other people? Am, am I? Uh... Yeah, 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 kind of, um, kind of. I think I guess I was comparing like when you get initiated into the golden dawn, for example. So you get initiated into a current and you, like you said, you become, you know, part of this current and part of this, that, that has a level of protection that's put over it. Um, and also too, you, you start to um, elevate your consciousness and it moves at your, your, your process a lot faster. It kind of like puts you on a train, you know, it's like instead of walking, you're now on a fast train. Um, now I understand that. Okay. But when I compare it to something like Reiki, um, I'm trying to wrap my head around that because one is putting you on something. This one is turning you into something. If we're comparing, for example, the golden dawn uh, initiation with your initiation into reiki mm -hmm. the similarities here are you have an instructor right mm -hmm. in one case it's the hierophant i'm unsure of the particular term i think it's just reiki masters reiki master. the reiki master right you have so you have someone that is that has already been initiated themselves and they now become a master and they can now instruct right um, and what they're doing in this particular process is pulling divine energy down. And then they're, and then the way that we describe it in the golden dawn is we're tainting the sphere of sensation of the candidate with this divine energy. 
Um, so we're changed. We're essentially it's being fundamentally changed and altered, um, you know, in terms of of its quality and characteristics. It's no longer what it was before, and it's the same thing in the Reiki tradition. The individual is pulling down an energy, just like you do when you do Reiki healing, right? They're pulling that energy down, and they're they're modifying you at an energetic level. So that you now have the ability to also become a Reiki healer. And the kind of the kind of front end of that, right, that hasn't really been discussed is the idea of something called spiritual lineage. This is also something that is um, <clears throat> a common theme in, in most uh, religious and spiritual traditions is the idea of coming, you know, from a particular spiritual lineage that gives someone an authority right so in the golden dawn tradition you what you would hear a lot uh, of conversation about is if a particular order or group has a lineage that might be associated for example with the original hermetic order of the golden dawn founded in the 1800s or a lineage associated with the wari ra temple for example right the idea behind that being that you have the authority to bestow, you know, that current and, and change that candidate's um, sphere sensation because the power has been given to you by predecessors that came before you and theirs before them. And the Golden Dawn tradition claims to have, for example, lineage really dating back to, um, you know, ancient history, the Egyptian mysteries, Chaldean mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries are all considered predecessors of the modern Golden Dawn order. So, you know, we we actually, you know, believe that a lot of the current that that was collected with the within the original um, order back in the, the 1800s, you know, um, came from what we call the third order that, you know, are essentially ascended masters, many of them coming from these previous traditions and those ascended masters then bestowing this pure current of divine energy. Same thing in Reiki. Same thing in the Eastern traditions. If you join a, a Buddhist sanctuary, for example, you become a Buddhist monk, you will go through an initiation procedure and they'll go through and they will name, you know, the, the, the previous masters that came before them, right? To essentially demonstrate the, what they call the purity of that particular current. And this is, you know, kind of unfortunately where um, you know, some dogma has the temptation to set in because if, you know, your order, you know, comes under the authority of a particular lineage, then many people believe, well, we're the only ones that can have that current. You don't have that current. We have that current. And you don't. So your order isn't legit or whatever. It, you know, it can cause a lot of um, human error, in my personal opinion. Um, so that doesn't mean to say that I don't believe that spiritual lineage is legit. It just means I don't necessarily personally, and I always say personal because I don't want people to think I'm putting my ideas on them, but I don't personally believe that that necessarily translates the idea that, well, we have we have the gift and you don't, right? Uh, same thing with it, you know, within the churches as well. Um, you know, Mormonism, for example, uh, they have their their founder, that's their the founding father of their particular tr tradition that they claim their lineage from. Uh, and, you know, overall, the Christian church in general would, cra would claim Christ, right, as the head mm -hmm. of their church by which they claim their lineage, um, you know, and unfortunately that has resulted in a lot of churches thinking they somehow have the only access to Christ or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you, know, that's the, you know, that's not the point, right? The point is, is that that current, you know, the reason that the person who's in that position of someone like the hierophant or the, the Reiki master or the yogi, you know, or something similar, you know, has the ability to do that is because they, they claim or have, um, you know, a current that has been bestowed upon them from people, you know, that come from the, the lineage. We even see this in martial arts, for example, right? Different mm -hmm. styles of martial arts have their own lineage. You know, Jalgar, Hungar, Wing Chun, 
you know, all come from their own particular lineages. And it's very important. You know, it's an it's important aspect, a facet of people's faiths and practices to claim lineage to something because it gives an authority. Personally, I think the underlying theme here really is, is that it's recognized inherently that divine current or energy or information comes from an authority, right? There's some, the buck stops somewhere, right? Um, you know, in 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 our order, for example, it's the prem when it comes to anything related to the education of the student body, that's the premonstrator. The buck starts with the stops with the person who's the premonstrator. If you have any questions related to the grade material that you think are unclear or you think it needs to be changed or anything of that nature. It would be the premonstrator that you would go to, um, you know, if there was really if there was a disagreement or anything, because they're the they're the authority there. Right. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, in my opinion, you know, the the authority on anything really is the divine and the divine, you know, being the authority can communicate that information that current in any way it sees fit. You know, I have I have seen situations I've been in a a part of a number of different spiritual groups in my life, including, you know, the transcendental meditation, you know, movement, the golden dawn system. You know, I studied Vedanta. I've been a part of, you know, the Greek Orthodox church, the Christian reformed church, the Catholic church, you know, my dad and mom's side of the family were Christian reformed Catholic. And I've seen people in positions of authority who were, you know, really behaving badly. They, i.e., didn't seem as if they were a very good model for that tradition or that faith. And yet they still somehow had the ability to bestow a current on someone. Because, and you could and you could see it was true because that person, you know, had the had the ability to start accelerating over time. And, you know, we could argue and say that that's just psychological. You know, it's like the placebo effect or something like that. But I personally think that that can only go so far in terms of someone's spiritual development. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the divine will use anyone and anything as a tool for its its will to be done, right? And and that one of the purposes of living this human life is to be, you know, in the classroom of God and to learn. So if it's your time, right? Your higher self has determined that it's your, you know, this is the time for you to really accelerate in your ascension process, right? It doesn't matter if this person over here isn't being a good model, you know, for the, for the work, they can still be utilized as a tool. Mm -hmm. You know, on that note, I see those people often get, you know, finally removed from the current if they can't, you know, correct themselves and, you know, with respect to their position and responsibility, eventually, you know, the divine also removes them. So they don't, they can't, you know, continue to harm people um, in negative ways. But there may be a period of time where they're going through, you know, being offered spiritual correction in, you know, in the divine and being given the chance and opportunity, not maybe being aligned, but still being utilized as a tool for the divine to ensure that other people are getting that current or energy, you know, and um, being able to change and transform so that the, the light isn't muted by other people's poor choices. Okay. So let's, um, let's dive into like, let's say you get into a spiritual lineage where you are being initiated into something like that. Um, but before we do that, I really, I want to kind of like, kind of explain that there's, with each one, there's, it's a slight difference. And this is part of the reason why I was asking you about Reiki um, you can, like you said, you can get a baptism and that is a form of initiation because you are literally being initiated into the, the spirit of God and, or Christ actually into that Christ consciousness. Okay. However, when you go into a spiritual tradition that is, um, maybe teaching things that they would consider secret because, um, humankind, not every single person is ready for that Im information that can be misused. And I think overall, as a culture, as a society, we're moving closer to all of those bells being dropped. But 
you you still have people out there that could misuse or abuse things if they have that kind of knowledge, right? And if you can understand that if something's done this way, you're going to invoke something beautiful, but if you do it the opposite way, you can you can invoke something terrible. Yeah, well, I get pissed off at somebody and I know this information and I can go and like do something really horrible to them. And and I think that um, that's where things have been kind of kept, you know, closed doors for a long time because of, uh, you know, holding that information back. Like even in the Bible, uh, part of the reason why uh, the Jews actually changed the name of God in the Bible but they changed it to Lord because if it's said correctly and it's vibrated a certain way, they can actually invoke it. And they didn't want that happening. They didn't want just random people running around invoking God. So there's, um, there's certain things like that, that, that kind of fall into the picture. So there, there are reasons why people kind of, hold <laughs> stuff, you know, for well, let's, let's talk about all the reasons. Yeah. You know, so, so, one thing, one thing that I'm sensitive about is is um, the actinal transmission fear, right? And when it comes to magical and mystical traditions, because many of the practices and the teachings have remained secret, there's always a strong temptation by the ego to turn something which is unknown into fear, right? The fear of the unknown. So let's go over the reasons why these secrets have been kept um, per, the, per the, the traditions, right? Number one, safety for you as an individual, right? Uh, uh, you know, things are becoming a lot more open these days. Spirituality, the idea of what spirituality is, is far more flexible. But we know, historically speaking, that's not always been so. We only have to look back at the Salem witch trials to understand how very dangerous, um, you know, leveraging a religion or spirituality can be and how hurtful it can be, right? So, you know, there have been ages that have existed amongst humanity in which, um, you know, revealing, you know, revealing that you were a member of a particular society or, you know, a, a coven or something like that could mean an immediate danger to you, Right. Even today, you know, while things have become much more flexible and, you know, here in the United States, uh, we have, you know, freedom of religion and people have gone to court over that. There are still people who have to be concerned about their, um, you know, relaying that they're part of a tradition like that. Right. I work, you know, as an engineer, I work with a lot of professionals and we have a number of, of um, people who work in scientific industries and engineering industries in our order. And they don't want they don't want to have their face on anything, their name on anything, because they're worried about, you know, the kind of backlash that they could have in their professional career about that. So we you know, this is one of the reasons why we use mottos and stuff like that. So it, number one, fundamentally, it's about it's about just physical safety, right? Safety for your physical person, your reputation, your career and your family. Right. For those who 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 themselves have fear of the unknown. And therefore want to take that out on you because, you know, whatever reason, right? Um, secondly, is the protection and, and safety is of, for you as an individual, right? Um, a lot of people in their lack of understanding of the way a spiritual system works, thinks that they can just jump on in there and start doing whatever techniques that they want. And all of a sudden now they're, they, they experience backlashes, you know, uh, that can impact them physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Um, <clears throat> I, I like to use uh, Kundalini as a great example. The Kundalini tradition is an incredibly powerful, beautiful tradition. It is amazing, you know, for the process of spiritual purification and union with the divine. Um, but I have witnessed myself over the years, people pick up a book on Kundalini that was just written by someone, you know, and start practicing techniques and they start raising and generating the Kundalini energy through their Shashuna. And, and now all of a sudden they're just, they start to take on, um, you know, really 
you know, poor manifestations of their health. You know, they start to get sick rather than heal. Why? Because they didn't know maybe that there were other procedures they needed to engage in. You know, they're trying to do it on their own. And, um, and, and that can sometimes result in, you know, a negative impact uh, to that person. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of leads to the topic of things like lines, right? Especially in magical books. There's tons of magical literature out there now that's been published. You know, this wasn't so 25 years ago, right? 25 years ago, you walk into a Barnes and Noble, it's like a book, you know, you got a Scott Cunningham book on herbs, Ray Buckland's book on witchcraft and Anton LaVey's book on, you know, Satanism. And that's all you could get, right? <laughs> but now there's a plethora of stuff and you have people who want to produce works right, to get people interested in seeking the mysteries, but they have vows, and so they change things, right, and and the unknowing person doesn't know that those things have been changed. There may have been a name that was changed, colors that were changed. I've even seen it be so innocuous as to read something and understand that the blind that was there was, were there just a few letters and a name that were altered, right, so it alters the pronunciation of the name. And in a magical tradition, there's a saying, by names and images are all powers awaken and reawaken. So if you're if you're not performing the technique correctly, right, you're not going to get the results because it's like an equation. It's it's mm -hmm. called a formula. I've actually seen I've actually seen books, I've actually purchased books that have done exactly what you're talking about. That um I can't remember the guy's name, Damien something, but he um, he would refer a lot of books. He teaches a lot of like magical stuff on um, on YouTube, and he would say, "Hey, this is a book you need to buy." So I ended up purchasing the purchasing uh, you know a couple of these books, and I noticed personally that when they were teaching, um, like for instance, lesser banishing ritual. They would um, they were mispronouncing or le or changing a letter in the divine names. And and I guess that's how they're getting away with it, <laughs> you know. Um, and and that's um, and this is where this is where I personally think it's this is where I feel like this leads to the purpose of an initiation because when you get initiated into a specific current you're given information and knowledge. Once you become initiated, right, and 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 it's it's uh, you're now recognized as different, right? This is what happens when you get baptized. Now you're part of the spiritual family, like for real. You get initiated. Now you're part of that particular group. That now gives you access to knowledge and information you didn't previously have, right? That also then subsequently infers that you are going to have access to somebody who's a teacher, a right. master or something that's qualified to teach that information to you. And that's something that isn't necessarily available when you get stuff out of books. And that's why it's, right. it's highly controversial, right? right. If right. There's, there's a benefit and a drawback to the publication of this information, mm -hmm. because on one hand, I personally think that it's increased awareness in these particular areas and it's made it so people are more amenable to them you know it's not so it's not so occult it's not so secretive that it's scary anymore mm -hmm. but it you know because of you know the misinformation that's printed it can lead you know to dangerous things for people um if they're unaware of how to appropriately practice the techniques which is why i always tell everybody you know go get the books enjoy the books there's a lot of great information in them Mm -hmm. If you're unfamiliar with the system or you haven't learned a system to the point where you can understand how mystical formula works and see it in the other traditions and therefore be able to practice other, uh, uh, engage in the practices of other traditions safely and effectively, mm -hmm. then go find a teacher because there's plenty of them out there. That's right? exactly, that's exactly right. And, and um, it's, when it comes to some of this higher knowledge and really being able to kind of speed up that process of elevating your consciousness to having that perfect communion with your higher self, there's, 
there is a process, like I said, that's been kind of keep cat behind doors. And, and where I was going with this, that I was trying to, where I started having brain farts, <laughs> is that if you do the process, because there's a key and there's a door, okay, to everything that we do, there is a key and a door. And each one of them has a special combination to be able to make something happen. And this is information that's been passed down, lentage over lentage, and person over person, mouth to ear, mouth to ear for so many years. And when you were written in books and there was nothing, no great material, there was no books, there was no videos, there was no other stuff. You had a teacher who taught you this. It's been passed down, passed down, passed down. And, and uh, what I personally find, it is dangerous for them to be producing these books. And I ended up getting one of them, actually, and noticed that there was a letter changed. And just the pronunciation of it can alter it. And, and that's the part that really kind of got me because when I was um, studying, you know, through my studies that I've had, there's, there's different angels that actually have a slight different pronunciation. It can have a Q in it. And in another pronunciation, it has a C or an S and it almost sounds the same. And, and, um, and it's like, well, wait a second, what's the difference here? And, you know, me and my little bit of dyslexia, I'm looking at this and looking at the spelling and going, oh, okay, that's the difference. This one has a Q. And so, it's um and and what are you doing you're invoking the wrong energy you're pulling in the wrong energy and that's where the problem is and that's why it's so important that you have somebody who's been <laughs> trained in this in this information instead of just going and buying a book also too the other reason that's important to do initiations is because you are being put on that current and some people may find that uncomfortable but if you if you're really wanting to accelerate your spirit, making that communion with the higher self, you're going to find that it's good. You're going to, things are going to go a whole lot better. One of the things that I found, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they say, I want to have, I want to make a connection with my higher self. I swear it's like almost every client now, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm serious. Like it's getting to a point to where, you know, it's like, Okay, I know this is what you want. Um, and one of the things that I was, um, you know, I know being in, in the Golden Dawn, I realized this is a process. We have to go through step one, step two, step three, step four. And sometimes it's a year to go through each, you know, initiation because you're going through multiple levels of initiating you into a higher current, into a higher level of consciousness. And and um, and so like trying to explain to them that it's not a one and done thing. I'm not going to just sit here and open up that channel for you so that you can you can make that connection. And then I I talk to people who say, oh, I've made my connection with my higher self and they haven't joined an order. They haven't done anything. And and as you get to talking to them, you start seeing all the toxicity in their life. And. And, and there's there's a lot of like anger and frustration and all this other stuff. And I'm like, OK, how do you know you made that connection? Because how do you know that that spirit is trying to make the connection? But there's all this is really dirty filter that it can't penetrate through. And that um, that really um, made a, a real strong connection with me when I was working with Patrick, when I would say, but my spirit guide said, and he would say, okay, so your spirit guide shows you an apple and says, go eat the apple. Are you going to go eat an apple or are you going to do something else? Because Michael might find that the apple means something completely different than Raphael or Gabriel, or maybe the goddess Isis, or <laughs> Christ <laughs> consciousness, they're all going to look at that apple differently. And he said, so if a spirit guide says, you'll find all your answers if you eat the apple, 
that meaning could be different if you're not, if you're, if your veil of understanding is clouded by what's going on in your life. And so sometimes initiations, I feel like what they do is they, they start wiping that veil. They start clearing that, um, not even a veil. It's more like a filter. It's that filter of the human condition. And it starts like peeling that away. The higher you get, the more it gets peeled away. I was talking to Karen, the astrologer, and also another friend of mine, a male guy that is in California, that's also in the order. And, um, and one of the things that we really, that it seems like everybody has in common is that there's this higher level of consciousness that we have and how we perceive things, the world, how we perceive this action, this behavior, this thing that happens, like somebody else is like freaking out and you're over here like, that's not something to get upset about. And you're perceiving the world differently. Your levels of consciousness is higher. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed, huge, like especially with the people that I joined with are at the same level and they're moving up, is that what ends up happening is, is that you start off like almost some of some of them almost like a victim mentality and then all of a sudden your consciousness shifts and you're not in that state anymore and some of your friends that have been victimizers all your life start like coming at you and you're like I'm not going to do that it doesn't align with me and and um there's this new awareness of of um of what has actually been going on in your life. There's because this level of consciousness starts shifting. And I think that when we describe being on a current, what exactly is that? It's this, it's this process that's moving you and it's like pushing you like at a, you know, at a higher level, much faster than climbing a ladder you know, it's, or walking down a street, it's like you're getting in a car and you're and it's, and there's something behind you. That's like the, like a hurricane that's pushing you forward, you know? And I've described to you probably many times is that it almost feels like a push behind me. Like something's making me do this, like not like physical, but energetically, it just feels like I should say this, or I should do this. Like I I've noticed like recently my, um, just things come to me. Like I, I was thinking the other day, like 12 o'clock at night, I woke up in the middle of night and I thought in my head, I need to call this person. I haven't talked to him in a little while. The next morning I get a text message and they said, Oh, I just got home late. And I was thinking about you. And I was thinking, no, no, no. It's like 12 o'clock. And I was thinking, I need to talk to you. (laughs) And, and, And I was like, oh, my God, that's exactly what time I woke up and I got that. And it's like you become this like beacon, like receiver almost, you know. And because you're because you're purifying your filter. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is allowing you to have a clear connection with your higher self. That's right. So you can hear it more. And as that and as you begin to ascend spiritually, then then your spiritual gifts start to to open up as well. I think one thing though that we should clarify is that initiation doesn't do the work for you. Initiation, it it fundamentally, it alters you at a fundamental level, energetically speaking, right? Like our physical body is just the densest version of our whole self. Um, And so you get altered out at those fundamental levels right, energetically speaking, and it tills the field, right? It makes it so you become more aware of your behaviors, of your thoughts, of other people. It helps you to question things. It, you know, it it essentially like um, uh, tills your your internal landscape and makes it fertile, right? And the, But the reason I say initiation doesn't do the work for you is that while it's opening you up, right? You still have to be a committed, uh, you know, component of your spiritual path. And that's another 
point of initiation, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, you don't get initiated into something without your free will being involved. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to join the church and I'm going to get baptized in the church. You're making a commitment. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, what you're meant to do after that is engage in the practices, you know, of that particular path to help accentuate that initiation. Now, if you never were initiated into anything at all, you would still develop slowly over time, right? We've been, you know, it's our, it's our purpose. And, you know, when we talk about astrology, right, I talk about the severial zodiac and the tropical zodiac, um, you know, there's a process where energies impose themselves upon us. That's like a slow evolutionary process. So we're going to get there eventually, right? It might be in millions and billions of years, kind of like when an amoeba comes out of the water and turns into a dinosaur, <coughs> right? If you go through the evolutionary process of self-development, it's all about just experiencing stuff enough, you know, to become a wiser, better person over many lifetimes. When you get initiated, that process gets accelerated. When you engage and commit in the process, then it becomes even more accelerated. And here's a little tip. If you engage in that process, not just not for the sole purpose of your own development, but for the purpose of becoming enlightened so you can help enlighten others, that process speeds up even more exponentially, right? Um, so the initiation primes you, but the practices are what really clarify, you know, the filter and open you up to your higher self. Your higher self is always there, right? It's meant to guide you. It's just your filter may not be as clean as it needs to be to discern appropriately what's what's being told to you or to really feel and recognize its presence. But it's there and you don't have to be initiated to experience it right mm -hmm. like before i was initiated and really you know went into my uh very deep spiritual journey when i was younger um you know the life that i led was you know not one that was the healthiest and there you know i ended up in a couple situations that were kind of dangerous and what you know when i reflect back on them the only reason I didn't get into big, big trouble is because right before the super bad thing was going to happen, there was like, you know, some would call like a light came on. Oh, you know, I need to get out of here. Right. Like, um, you know, it's, it literally saved my life, you know, one time. And um, I understand now that that was my higher self coming in, you know, essentially giving me clarity in the moment, even though I was off in la la land, you know, totally ignorant of what was going on. You know, here comes my higher self to give me a moment of clarity that was so strong and compelling. I stopped what I was doing and I got out of there and then something really terrible happened. Like I was, for example, one time when I was in college, uh, I'm at the club. You know, and my friends at the time were, you know, drug dealers and they were ecstasy dealers. Um, this is 25 years ago. So <laughs> more than that, actually, more Even than that. You look young. Fair, yeah. <laughs> baby. It well, wasn't, it wasn't spirit, about four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I really, the spirit keeps you young, you know? I know. Being in the energy of the spirit is, you know, a, 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 like a kind of like the philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. in my opinion. But um, yeah, you know, and I'm not, I'm out there trying to find my friends to find some drugs and I'm starting to get mad. I'm like, I'm not going to have a good time. I can't find my friend. And all of a sudden I just got this, like, it was like a spiritual slap in the face. And I stopped and I was like, God, what am I doing? You know, like I can't have fun because I need drugs. It just totally deflated me. Right. But it was like this huge energy came in. And then just made me a cognizant of who I was and what was going on. And I, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go home, you know. And I went and I left. And five minutes later, that club got raided by the police. Uh -huh. And three of my friends got arrested. And one of them ended up committing suicide, unfortunately, because he didn't want to go back to prison for the rest of his life because he was on parole. You know, and that really, and then later on that summer, another one of my friends in that friend group committed suicide. 
And that totally changed my life, right? That one moment, of, there was nothing going on except for me being an idiot and poo, boom, right? And I, and I felt disgusted with myself and I left, changed my whole life, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I could have, I could have been in big trouble. And, you know, I, when I think back on it, I mean, I just feel like, wow, you know, how would my life have been altered in other ways had I stayed there, you know? And then I reflect back on, on, you know, the people that I knew and how they were impacted. Right. Um, and I had, I had, I had other experiences like that in other situations. So, you know, I, I bring it up because I want people to know and understand that they have a connection with God already. The practices of a spiritual tradition emphasize that and augment it. The initiations that people go through when they join a church or a group or something can also help magnify it. Even if it's a group where, you know, there isn't a mystical component or they don't have a particular initiation that they claim a lineage through or something, becoming a part of that group and even beginning those practices in general can help fundamentally alter you. But initiation works based on a divine formula that inherently exists um, that's been given to us by the divine so that we can accelerate our pathway and become what I would refer to as a spiritual athlete. And it's, and it's, you know, it's incredibly powerful. You can talk to many people and hear about their, their experiences, but you know, what I, what I don't want people to leave here with today is thinking that is, is an us versus them mentality or black and white. I don't want people to think, well, I haven't been initiated into something, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't got it or, you know, anything like that. Right. I, I've, I've watched the spirit initiate people. I've seen people a part of no tradition who get initiated in the spirit. If it's your time, it's your time. But if you get initiated in the spirit, you know, and you're listening to this, you may recognize, you know, mm -hmm. I remember this one time when this, this, and this happened and it totally changed me spiritually. And then I started to see these different results in my life and the opening up of spiritual gifts and an increase in inner peace. Um, you know, you can, you could maybe come to understand that you have gone through some type of initiation. So there's, there's structured groups out there that exist that can provide initiation. But if, you know, if let's just say you live in the backwoods of Tennessee and you don't have access to anyone, right? No one that can teach you anything. You don't have an internet, you know, on a regular basis. You just happen to come across this podcast when you're at the library or visiting a friend in another state or something. Right. And you just have no ability to, to, to get initiated into something or join a group or get a teacher. You know, one thing I can say is if you're truly genuine in your drive and desire to be in spiritual communion with the divine, you can, God will provide that to you. Right. Mm -hmm. you just have to uh, please I, change me, transform me, pray, meditate. Find what you can, you know, I would personally not recommend trying to get involved in techniques that you're really unaware of, but there's a lot of techniques that are totally safe for everyone, right? Like med mm -hmm. there are lots of forms of meditation. Meditation is, I've never heard anyone say, oh, I went and meditated and some bad stuff happened, right? <laughs> and meditation is a real, if you really sit and practice meditation that mm -hmm. that allows your consciousness to transcend so what i mean by that is it's not just a meditation to you know get in touch with your breath and lower your blood pressure right but but a technique that helps you to transcend your thoughts your feelings your emotions and get you in touch with that underlying you know uh, unified field then you will find yourself accelerating and if in your heart you're truly desirous of the Lord. We call it zeal, zeal for the Lord. You will find yourself, right? That's the, 
in my opinion, that's where the real initiation happens. It happens in the heart and it happens because the person is truly desirous of it, right? I've also seen a lot of people get initiated into a, into different traditions that go nowhere and do nothing. Why? Because they're spiritual tourists. They wanted to do something they thought was cool or trendy or you know, they just wanted to check it out. They really didn't care nor desire to be doing the work, right? And so, you know, people have asked me, well, what happens? You know, in my personal opinion, what happens is, yes, they were bestowed with a true current, but in this lifetime, they weren't meant to become the spiritual athlete and become enlightened. They'll still be a talisman and collect that light over time and find themselves accelerating at a, a click faster than they were before, but they're still going to be on a slower process than they would have, right? If, however, in your heart, you truly desire to leverage that system and that initiation and that current, you know, in order to achieve union with the divine, you're going to find yourself accelerating very quickly. And, um, you know, but you're but you, but you got to put in work too, right? People have to understand that, like anything else, becoming a master of the self, becoming a master of the path, becoming a master that can teach others eventually is something that takes work mm -hmm. and dedication. You have to be willing to learn the lessons, to overcome your ego, to master your emotions, you know, in the face of sometimes even great adversity, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those are tools given to you so that you can ascend. You know, the, just the, the stuff that feels good and and floofy and, you know, we call it the ISIS phase, right? That has its purpose. The apophis phase has its purpose, too. It's part of the formula, um, you know, EIO, ISIS, apophis, Osiris. Yeah. You, you are immersed in the energy, the beautiful energy of the spirit. You go through a transformation where you die to old ways, old thoughts, old feelings, old emotions, old habits. Through that process, you learn about yourself and how to master yourself. And then you're, you know, you're risen at like Osiris slain and risen or Christ slain and risen um, mm -hmm. and transfigured, you know, or, um, you know, there's a lot of different solar type of deities, right, that are associated with being slain and risen. Ra is another example. Um, uh uh, Mithra is another example, right? The theme here is you have to die to arise. The Eleusinian mysteries, you know, one of the mystery traditions from ancient Greece that our tradition is founded on had a, you know, twice a year, they celebrated their mysteries, the lesser mystery tradition, the greater mystery tradition, and, and encompassed within those very secret mysteries, mysteries that were so secret, you know, the under pain of death right, is what you had to promise. If you expose those mysteries, that was it. The what, what archaeologists have been able to uncover and what we've been able to learn over time is that those mysteries centered and focused on just the descent into Hades, the story of Persephone, descent into Hades, her spending time there and then being reunited with her mother. And you know, so she also was slain and risen to a, a certain, degree, you know, as a component of that. But, you know, the end result was her becoming a master of death, right? She returns to Hades every year, then returns to her mother. She becomes a master of death. And when she becomes reunited with her mother during the spring and summer months um, of the year, uh, you know, the joy that she feels um that's perceived and the way that it was described by plato and some of the other people who experience those mysteries they don't give up the techniques or anything but they describe their experiences was one of all-encompassing love union joy ecstasy you know after having gone through a, a process that we can only hypothesize was intense it took nine days to go through the process of an eleusinian mystery initiation um nine being associated with unity interestingly mm -hmm. enough and you know the the information out there indicates it was a pretty intense 
process of purification and then going through procedures that essentially forced your consciousness to break free from its old perceptions and the, and, and the removing of the veil um, until you, and then you entered into a state of spiritual union and ecstasy. And you could, you could go back and witness the, the rituals again and again, but you could only go through them one time. Once you were initiated. That's interesting. Hmm. So this has been a really enlightening conversation. And I really do hope that everybody got out of it and their questions answered. Uh, and if you have any questions or even if you disagree, I mean, we don't mind. We love the comments. We want to see what your thoughts are and what your questions are and let us uh, it gives us an opportunity to kind of address these things and with that being said you guys have a beautiful day and we will see you very soon bye, bye. bye.